as I said, good afternoon. It's a, a early morning here for me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and jump right into this presentation uh, so that we do leave uh, times uh, for uh, questions, and I'll throw my video on at that time. Uh, for those that uh, may have come across my, uh, my name uh, or work, um, uh, it is public uh, sort of knowledge, I guess, that uh, I, I'm contributed to or essentially contributed to the uh, the U.S. Cyber Command's uh, new doctrine of cyber, uh, uh, persistent engagement and, uh, and strategy to defend forward. I've worked with uh, the UK's uh, National Center, MOD and NCF. Um, and so I have to start the talk off by saying that uh, uh, this is me as a professor uh, uh, of uh, political science and uh, strategic studies. Uh, and anything that I have to say today uh, is not uh, representing uh, any uh, government uh, agency. Um, the most important thing, if you take away from uh, this talk, uh, is this first slide uh, is my email address, uh, richard.harknet at uc.edu. I really want to commend uh, the network for putting on this uh, three-day uh, workshop. <clears throat> the... It, it, my first uh, analysis that I did for, for the US government was back in uh, 1993, uh, so some 29 years ago. Uh, some of you may not actually have been born by that time, which is a scary thought for me. Uh, but <clears throat> this is a problem that we need more eyes on uh, and, and uh, more perspectives, right? And so uh, I spent a lot of time with computer scientists uh, and uh, computer engineers and uh, IT specialists but this is not a technical problem. Cybersecurity is a political, economic, social, organizational, and behavioral challenge in a technically fluid environment. And it's that fluidity uh, that uh, we have to deal with. But understanding this uh, as a strategic space, and part of the, our little um, graphic there is to, is to capture that um, so the game of chess is understood as a, as a classic game of strategy. In this case, uh, we're trying to capture the notion that uh, um, malware in particular is constantly multiplying the challenges that we have, uh, we can never anticipate. So you may actually be playing more than one night. Um, and then in cyberspace, we're never sure of uh, the sources. And so uh, what you think you might be able to anticipate, the move of a night, um, the shadow suggests that maybe actually you're playing a bishop. Uh, and so how do you deal with this? Uh, we have a book coming out uh, through Oxford University Press uh, here in a few months. I'm going to try uh, called Cyber Persistence Theory. It's the theory behind uh, the new doctrine and strategy. It's coming through their Bridging the Gap uh, series. I'm going to try to take you through in the next uh, 17 minutes um, the essence of uh, the arguments. Uh, and uh, we'll see what you think about uh, those. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, make sure my slides. So a couple of propositions right off the back. Uh, war is war this morning. The United States and Russia uh, are uh, uh, in negotiations about uh, Ukraine and trying to avert a war. Uh, if they don't, we'll know what that is, right? We know what war is. And what we're seeing in cyberspace uh, for um, for the majority of behavior is not war. But very importantly, it's not simply intelligence contest either, right? It's not just espionage and surveillance and um, subversion, right? There is in fact strategic advantage being sought and being cumulatively gained. And so the question really becomes, how do we explain what we are observing if traditional modeling of this both as coercive, coming from coercion theory, coercion uh, in the form of war, or in um, traditional uh, intelligence studies, if neither one of those frames <clears throat> actually helps us explain what uh, we have been observing in the operational uh, space. And so I'm gonna make uh, the following key points in this talk. The way to understand what we're observing is to understand that cyberspace is actually a distinct strategic environment, one that we call initiative persistent. If you're going to secure yourself 
you have to seek the initiative in a persistent way. Why? Because the structure of this environment is different than what we have seen in other technological environments. The core features uh, is uh, interconnectedness, a condition of constant contact, and in this case, the fluidity and inherent exploitable vulnerability. I'll come back to all three of those uh, shortly. An initiative persistent environment, ultimately security is obtained through action and anticipating action in order to reduce a majority of adversary activity to inconsequential effect. That is a loaded statement, right? Note that security is not flowing from the absence of action, right? We became very used to this in a deterrent environment, right? I know I'm secure because nobody's attacking me. But if we're in a persistent environment, in, by definition, uh, action is occurring all the time, then security is actually going to come from making sure that those act, that activity, that action, is not accumulating up to consequential effect at the national economic and national security uh, level. You can't impose strategy on a strategic environment and succeed. You actually have to understand the environment itself and then derive a strategy. So for millennia, uh, what we put under the rubric of a conventional strategic environment, uh, basically it's about offense and defense. And it's the relative advantages of the offense and the defense of technology, tactics, operations that ultimately will accumulate up to explaining how you secure, right? So in an offense advantaged environment, you have to secure slightly differently, technically, tactically than a defensive one, but it's this relative balance between offense and defense. In 1945, one plane, one bomb, one city, we had a technological leap. In fact, the creation of another strategic environment in which because one plane, one bomb, one city, uh, we had to assume an offense dominant strategic environment. That meant the offense always won. I could literally press the button and destroy you. Cyber, we're arguing in this book, uh, represents the third strategic environment. It is fundamentally not about offense defense advantage, nor is it an offense dominant because you can defend in this space, but you only defend in the moment and you can't have any attrition effect, right? And so therefore we come up with this new construct of being initiative persistent in the pursuit of security. And let me walk you through that. So every speech that you might all hear about cyberspace starts off with something like, it's global and interconnected. And then almost everything that follows, particularly in government policy pieces, uh, although this is changing significantly, and you see this in the new UK uh, national strategy that was just released, um, we're the traditional response has been to segment, right? Um, but if it is in fact an interconnected space, then segmentation is not the answer. You have to actually try to figure out how do I secure when I'm in interconnected. And that requires you to accept the notion that <clears throat> this space creates a specific condition, a condition of constant contact. So it changes the security question. How do I secure when I'm in constant contact, not just with my own space, right? My domestic population, my own business, but globally, right? with uh, business writ large, with allies, with foreign citizens, and of course, in constant contact with my adversary. This is a specific condition that we're not used to in the terrestrial space, right? In the terrestrial space, contact is episodic, it's potential, right? But it is not constant. And so, Playing up on this uh, strategy uh, metaphor uh, in chess, the normal board, you would have seen a contained set of squares, right, and a contained set of players. But in cyberspace, the way to visualize this is to understand that every new version of software, hardware, or process that links them together literally updates the terrain in which we must achieve security. So what I was defending 
this morning when you began your workshop, cyberspace has changed. There's another version out there of it. And there is spaces on the quote unquote board of this strategic competition that you don't even know you have to defend, let alone have the ability to defend. And so this fluidity is extremely challenging from a security perspective. But on top of that, is that this, the ubiquitous of this technology and its um, accessibility, right, means that I have to seek national security in a space of tremendous complexity because again, interconnected, I'm in contact with individuals, black hat hackers, white hat hackers. I'm in connection with economic actors. Those are my green players, gray actors, my organized crime and, uh, and the like kinds of actors. And then your traditional nation state and we're actually playing out this strategic competition in everyone else's space. So it's not that I can just contain national security or national economic activity in a particular space with a particular set of rules. I have to actually conduct those affairs in a space in which others with very different motivations are also having potentially consequential effect that I have to get out in front of. And so persistence as a systemic dynamic in cyberspace, this is the way we have to understand, regardless of where you come at cybersecurity, if you come at this from a technical standpoint or from a, a socio-technical or from a political technical space, um, you under have to understand the space you're in. An initiative persistent environment is one that you can defend, but you, again, you defend only in the moment. But the cumulative effect of your defense, what we are seeing in this space is that it actually has little impact in the overall scale and scope of adversaries' capacity to act. That is that if you shut one thing down, <clears throat> one pathway, you need to expect that they're not going home, right? But they're moving on to another vulnerability. And so what does this mean from uh, building a theory to explain all of this? Well, we start with this structure, right? Of interconnectedness, constant contact and a base technology that fluidly reconfigures, is ubiquitously accessible and inherently vulnerable to unauthorized and unexpected use by others. This is baked in because this is the way the ARPANET originally was structured. It was all about access, not about security. So if you take those things together, structurally what we have is a space that creates incentives, right? It rewards those that can anticipate the exploitation of vulnerability and therefore there's an imperative to persist in staying ahead of that exploitation. If you're able to anticipate the exploitation of your vulnerability before it's exploited, and so much of that is in the, def if you would categorize it in a defensive kind of context, if you can anticipate that exploitation of vulnerability before it's actually exploited, relative to everybody else, you're going to be more secure. Because of interconnectedness, this cannot be done as a whole of government approach, but in fact has to be done as a whole of nation, whole of society approach. So the, the National uh, Cybersecurity Center, uh, which I was able to go to uh, when uh, I first arrived in England uh, back in 17, just as it was opening up uh, to do my Fulbright uh, professorship, um, is, is trying to organize everybody into the right space, right? So private sector, the public sector, academe. And, and I'm very glad that uh, Paul was here to, to solicit um, greater engagement because I know that this is something very important uh, to the success of the center. Uh, and so <clears throat> the core analytical concepts that are built into the, the book 
uh, and I'm not trying to sell the book, but you'll have to get the greater explanations uh, there in a few in a few months if you're interested. Um, ultimately, we boil this down to is that we've got lots of theories of coercion, and they help us understand war fighting, deterrence of war. Um, they also help us understand how states prepare for coercion, uh, and that's the intelligence studies uh, literature. But what if this is not about coercion? If we look empirically at the public record of what is occurring in cyberspace that's relevant to national security, it's not about coercion. It's not about shaping the calculus of the other side. It's in fact about direct exploitation, about using code to take advantages of others' cybers, uh, others' uh, vulnerabilities for the purposes of gaining, and in the case of nation state behavior, trying to gain strategic advantage. That's the dominant behavior. So states are actually setting and resetting conditions of security and insecurity directly. So we've uh, come up with uh, trying to capture this by calling this the, the cyber fatal complete, right? That in fact, <clears throat> it doesn't matter what the other side is doing. We're just going about in the pursuit of our security, the resetting and setting conditions to our advantage. And cyberspace allows this. So this is very different than the uh, Hollywood movie uh, version of uh, cyber direct engagements, right? Where uh, the attacker and the defender are right there on the computer screen and they're interacting with each other and they're, they're toing and fraying uh, and deflecting each other. That does happen, but it happens very rarely, right? In most of the cases, the, the defender or the, uh, the, the site that's been exploited um, is actually finding out many, many days, months later. We're improving that. Right? But we know uh, from public uh, records uh, that uh, that is it's not happening simultaneously. And so if we're trying to get back to that original question, how do I secure around the activity that's actually happening? Not what we anticipated back decades ago, big cyber war, big attacks, right? Or ah, let's just bottle this up. It's not really anything new. It's just in, uh, intelligence by another name. But if it is in fact about strategic competition or the expectation of strategic gain, then what we have to recognize is the manner in which states are going about this um, is in fact these state of completes. It's about parallel actions. We are moving past each other in cyberspace, cons constantly trying to reset conditions in a way that, um, advances our national interests versus another state's national interests. And so that may not sound like a great place to be. I'm not making a normative assessment, right? The idea here is um, we have to try to explain and therefore then develop the strategies and policies to deal with the reality that we have. Does this mean an environment of constant interaction that destabilizes. Um, our argument and the models that we've uh, looked at and the case studies that we've done suggest no, right? That while this is an environment that rewards parallel action, um, and it is an environment that we have to assume constant action, there is structuring incentives that uh, tend towards stability. So at the macro level, what made the ARPANET and then internet as its core, as the, as the core structure element of cyberspace, why did we go there? We went, it, this was uh, a, a structure about a communication system that could survive without a center, right? That was the whole idea behind networking, right? Is how do you communicate without a central authority? And so what we got left with is in fact, systemically at the macro level, incredibly resilient to 
activity that we never anticipate. But that macro resilience rests on a micro vulnerability, millions of micro vulnerabilities. But what we're seeing um, is that, so first of all, so there's two conditions that tend to help the stability, and then I'll finish up, is this macro level resilience can absorb most of this exploitation. It's in fact absorbing the ex exploitation, right? The internet is not blowing up. But from a behavioral analysis, what we see is that states are staying way far below activity for the most part that would come near going to war in cyberspace or um, why? Well, because if you can gain strategically without going to war, why would you go to war? Why would you engage in death and destruction when in fact you have a new avenue, a new seam to play and advance your national interests? Well, below that. And so the abundance, this is somewhat counterintuitive, the abundance of vulnerability becomes an abundance of opportunity. And therefore, there's an incentive to continue to exploit a system that you don't actually destabilize. And so then you have to come up with an ability to try to manage this. The US response is the doctrine of persistent engagement. Be happy to take up a little bit of that in, in Q&A. So in the end, not a great place. Um, do we have to worry? Yeah, I worry every day. Um, but I also am a half glass full uh, uh, strategist and recognize uh, that we have dealt with technological revolution before. We've been able to come up with what at the time seemed a crazy idea, right? That security was no longer in my hands, but sat in the heads of my opponent. That's deterrence, right? And that the world survival rested on that rational calculation. Um, but in the end, um, um, I think the efforts that you're making uh, to try to, uh, to put brain power onto this problem uh, ultimately uh, will help us um, work this out.